Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Before we get into today's video, special shout out to my most recent super thankers, Gareth McKee 5927, James LaMica, Jack Patterson 8389, Santiago 8041, Lark LaTroy, and Piao Meow Noir in a waifu car. Thank you all very much for your kind support of my channel. You are the atheistic abscess in the Bible-thumping bicuspid, diligently dissolving their dogmatic dental plan. Thank you very much for helping me to continue to do what I do. And if you like what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe, click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out, and of course, like the video, pop in a comment, all that goes a long way towards pleasing that which is more powerful than the TVA itself, the YouTube algorithm. Is this the greatest power in the universe? And keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. Today we're going to be hearing again from our old friend Tom Brown of Tom Brown Ministries and Word of Life Church. Most of his videos and social media presence is focused on just preaching to the faithful and telling believers how they can be resolute in their faith or how to live a more godly life. But every now and again, he decides to set his sights on atheism and try to offer up arguments against it. Usually those arguments are predicated on a gross misunderstanding of the atheistic mindset, insisting atheism is a worldview when it's not, claiming that because atheism isn't more popular, it can't be correct, which is a claim so ridiculous, makes me want to laugh out loud. And today, he's going to be telling us why atheism has nothing to offer. I wasn't aware my rationality, viewpoints, and basic integrity were for sale. I didn't know that I should be setting my perspective about what's true, or most likely true, based primarily on what I could get out of it. I mean, call me crazy. You're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> but I was under the impression that one's beliefs should be congruent with the evidence, not which ideology is going to promise you the biggest participation trophy. But maybe that's just me. Maybe I've got Tom all wrong. So let's turn it over to him and have him tell us why atheism has nothing to offer. Atheism has nothing to offer. That's right. They don't offer a God who loves you, a God who's given you purpose, a God who has sacrificed his life. And Christianity does? I mean, I know that Christian dogma keeps insisting that God loves all humanity, but that love looks less like a proud papa and more like an abusive drunken stepfather who blames you for making him hit you. And hey, I don't want to hit you, baby, so please don't make me, okay? You're my one and only. You gotta do right by me, okay? Okay. The idea is that God created everyone. All of us. And not that he mixed up the ingredients, threw us in the oven, and let us turn into whatever we would turn into. It says in Jeremiah 1.5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. The idea is supposed to be that all-knowing God not only knows everything you will become throughout all of your life, but that he specifically put all of that into you. All of your talents and intelligence and aspirations and interests all come from God. He created you to be everything that you would become. That means that he not only knows all the future atheists will be atheists, but that he made us to be atheists. Much like he did with Pharaoh, he hardened our hearts. And the same is true of any member of other non-Christian faiths who reject Christianity in favor of their own religions. God also made them knowing that they would reject Christianity and knowing the future and being all-powerful in his creation abilities made them purposefully to reject Christianity. And for all of that, for doing exactly what he made us to do, he's going to throw us into hell for all eternity. Gee, thanks, God. I'd say your love keeps me warm at night, but it's hard to tell what is actually keeping me warm what with all this hellfire and all. As for giving us purpose, well, he can keep it. I'd much rather choose my own purpose for myself. And for the life of me, I can't understand the Christian mindset that wants to be told what to do in that regard. 
Why do you even want to be given a purpose? I mean, what's the point of the free will that you claim God bestowed upon humanity if our ultimate purpose is pre-selected for us, absent of our input on the matter? Here, little humans, have the ability to choose everything for yourself, but I'm assigning you a cosmic destiny, and if you go against it, if you choose something other than what I have chosen for you, bullet train to hell. What is the point of that? other than to be the most colossal cosmic dick imaginable, and then getting the very people he's screwing over to praise him for doing so. And as far as dying for us, yeah, big sacrifice. I mean, he's God. He incarnates as Jesus, he dies, he goes back to heaven and back to his full God powers. It's like a video game programmer creating a character to play in his own game to check out the bugs, and then when his character dies, he just goes back to tinkering with the program. Not exactly a stupendous act of love and bitter sacrifice. Not that any of this matters, seeing as I don't believe any of it happened. And that's kind of the point. You say I shouldn't be an atheist because it doesn't offer a god to believe in, but I don't believe in any god. That's why I'm an atheist. It's not like I decided I wanted to be an atheist and only then found out that that means not believing in God and went, aw shucks, well, since I want to be an atheist so bad, I have to get rid of my God belief. Too bad. No, I already didn't believe in God and that's why I became an atheist, not the other way around. I want you to think for a moment. Contrast the atheistic message with the message of Christianity. Message of Christianity is so positive. God created the worlds. And if he created the worlds, and since he did, then he created it with a purpose. And what was that purpose? To provide a habitable place called planet Earth. To raise up living creatures, and among them, the most important living creature, human beings, made in the image of God. Creatures that have the ability to believe in God. He made trillions of galaxies each containing billions and billions of stars, around which orbit even more planets, dwarf planets, moons, comets, asteroids. He made nebulas, black holes, radiation fields, asteroid belts, pulsars, quasars, cosmic microwave background radiation, and the rapid expansion of space-time. And then, after nine and a half billion years, he makes a relatively small mud ball, comparatively unimpressive next to some of the other planets around. Then four and a half billion years and multiple mass extinction events later that cause the extinction of billions of life forms that predate modern biological life, we humans finally come along. And you expect me to believe that all of that prologue was relatively meaningless? That it was all just window dressing, waiting for us, the only really important things to ever exist, to come along? And then, the idea is that he's going to come back again and destroy all of it. Absolutely everything in the whole of existence, long, long before we ever gain the ability to even detect 99% of all the rest of the universe, let alone truly explore and appreciate it all? Tom... What is the point of doing all of that? What is the point of the preceding 13 and a half billion years before we got here? Or the existence of trillions of galaxies that we will never reach, will never see, or even be noticed by us, the beings who it all was supposedly made for? It makes no sense. But the message of Christianity is that man rebelled against God very much like a child rebels against their parents. No, it isn't. The story of Christianity is that God created man and woman unable to distinguish right from wrong, and then they were told to eat from a tree, and had no concept that doing so was wrong because they didn't know what wrong was. So they did as they were told. And God got pissed off, even though he had to have known in advance that they would do it, and so he kicked them out. It's less like a child rebelling against their parents and more like telling an infant not to fill their diaper and then when they do, because they don't know any better, you drop kick them out the window. But God doesn't give up on us. He loves us so much that he gave his one and only son. Why always with this one and only son business? 
as if he couldn't reincarnate himself any time he wanted. What makes you think that the God that you believe in hasn't come back in thousands of different forms since Jesus? I mean, the Bible doesn't extend much past Jesus' death. There have been thousands of years since it ran out of stories to tell. And yeah, it says that Jesus is coming back and that that will signal the end of the world. But why couldn't God come to earth in various other incarnations that weren't Jesus? How do you know that God hasn't had many, many quote-unquote sons? And daughters, for that matter. What makes you think God hasn't taken all kinds of human and various other animal forms just to keep up on what's going on down here? Or to take in a Taylor Swift show, if even he could get tickets? Maybe play some skee-ball. You don't know what he does with his eternity. God's a skee-ball fanatic. <laughs> the Lord has quite a fancy for the game. He's been playing it for years. He assumes a human form once a month and indulges. Doesn't tell anyone where he's playing. He just goes away for a couple of hours. The message of Christianity is God exists. And God, the creator, loves you. That's the message of Christianity. And that God can forgive you of your past sins. So you don't have to live in guilt over your past mistakes that you've made. God shouldn't be solely capable of forgiving past misdeeds. That should largely, if not entirely, be up to the people who were wronged by your misdeeds. If you say, cheated on your wife, she found out, and as one would expect, the shit hit the fan, and you were racked with guilt because of it, would you really feel all better if you just prayed to God to forgive you? Seriously? You don't think maybe you might owe an apology to your wife? You know, the person actually negatively impacted by your actions? You don't think the person you hurt might be due some groveling? At least as much as the man you think is upstairs who wasn't particularly harmed by it all? Maybe that's something that atheism does have to offer over Christianity. The guilt you feel for your wrongdoings is alleviated by making restitution to those you harmed, seeking to redress what you've done wrong, and thus actually making the world a little better. Rather than just folding your hands, silently saying you're sorry to your invisible friend, assuming that he says you're all good, and then going about your day. While those you hurt, continue hurting. But hey, that's not your problem, right? I'm sure God will tend to their pain, right? You've been forgiven. So it's nothing you have to worry about. But yeah, atheists are the ones who are morally bankrupt, right? On top of that, God gives you purpose and the promise of eternal life. That when you die, you're still going to live on forever. And you're going to live in a place called paradise, heaven, where, where, where there would be no more pain or suffering like this present world has. You know, when I was little, I played this game called Candyland. Oh, it was a wonderful game. Full of gumdrop rainbows and lollipop fields, cotton candy clouds, chocolate mountains licorice lagoons, and slopes of ice cream. And as a three-year-old, boy, I really wanted to live in Candyland. And I thought that if I were good, maybe I would someday. But it was just a fanciful fiction. A fancy fantasy. It, of course, was never real. And only the foolish heart of a naive child could think such nonsense actually existed. Why am I telling you this? Um, I don't know. I'm sure it ties back into what you said in some way, but I just lost my train of thought, I guess. Anyway, carry on, Tom. But God also gives us empowerment in this life. He promises those who have been born again, ask the Father for the Holy Spirit and he will give him to you. And that's what happened to me when I was around 18, 19 years old. I asked the Father for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit came upon me and I fell on the ground and was laid down on the ground for a couple of hours. And there God filled me with his power. Are you sure you weren't having an aneurysm? Have you had a CAT scan lately, Tom? I'm worried about your health, buddy. And he gave me the gift of tongues. From that time on, I was able to preach in a powerful way. Is this video supposed to be an example of that? Is this rhetoric your God-given A-game? I was able to pray for the sick and see them recover. 
And since then, I have seen hundreds, perhaps even thousands of healings and miracles simply because I prayed. And some of them I laid hands on as, as Jesus told us to do. I have seen miracles in my life. I'd be interested to know what you consider miraculous. Because I'd be willing to bet that what you and I would consider to be miracles would be very different things. A miracle is defined as a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. Now, the crucial part in that is the event in question must be inexplicable by natural or scientific law. And this is the bit that continually trips up theists. As they're frequently declaring things that have natural explanations, even multiple possible natural explanations, as miracles. A person's cancer went into remission. Miracle. Every time a baby is born, it's a miracle. A faithless person begins going to church. God worked a miracle in their heart. An addict gets the strength to get clean and sober and turn their life around. That strength is a miracle from God. Literally every supposed miracle that theists drone on and on about all have simpler, more mundane, and immensely more probable natural explanations. Cancer goes into remission, sometimes even without treatment. It's not inexplicable. Sometimes the body is able to fight off cancerous growths and tumors. People can change their minds, go from non-believers to believers. Or sometimes addicts decide they've had enough of their lifestyle and resolve to make a change. Humans procreate, just like literally every other animal. None of this stuff is miraculous. Until you can prove real miracles, that would be things that absolutely defy any scientific explanation or naturalistic cause, then you have nothing. Stop using your faith healing to get people to overcome addiction or sprained ankles. Come let me know when you did like JC himself supposedly did, make the blind see by spitting in dirt and rubbing it in the blind person's eye. Or regrow the limb of an amputee. Choose a modern day Lazarus and raise him from the dead four days after being medically declared dead. Pull off a real miracle and then we'll talk. But stop classifying unlikely but mundane occurrences as miracles just to suit your needs. And on top of that, I know one day when it's my time to die, I'm not going to go into non-existence. I'm going into the presence of God. Now contrast Christianity's great positive message with the atheists. The atheists remind me as, as Eeyore, the donkey and Winnie the Pooh. Hello. I'm an atheist. God doesn't love you because God doesn't exist. The universe is an accident. You're an accident. You have no purpose. And when you're dead, you cease to exist. That's life. The best you can live is eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. Anything said in an Eeyore voice sounds depressing. That was literally Eeyore's entire shtick. Sorry to disappoint you. Guess I'm too dull to be around. Can't blame you for moving away. Here, let me try. I'm a Christian. We're all chained to God's plan. Just pawns in his design. And if we don't fulfill our role to his satisfaction, we'll burn in hell for all eternity. Or if you're just not a Christian... Your Jewish friends? Hell. Islamic ones? Hell. Literally any non-Christians, regardless of how good and kind they are? Hell. For all eternity, burning forever. So you better love God the right way and ignore Him giving little kids cancer or allowing them to be assaulted by His supposedly holy messengers in His own church. Also, your pets don't have souls, so you'll never see Fluffy again once she dies and gets buried in the backyard. On the other hand, the atheist position is that we're free, autonomous beings who can choose our lives and purpose for ourselves. We can go with whatever ideological path we believe will make us better and happier individuals. 
We can work with and for each other to collaboratively make this world the best it can be for all people, rather than just putting our faith in an absentee God character to do it for us. And when we die, absolutely no one gets cast into eternal torment for choosing the wrong belief system. There's no pain, suffering, or misery after death. Just eternal peace. But of course, that's not even a uniform atheistic position. Because there is no reason an atheist can't believe in an afterlife of some form. Atheism is not a rejection of spirituality or belief in the supernatural. It's nothing more and nothing less than not believing in any god or gods. But any atheist position sounds a hell of a lot better than the Christian one. Even though what sounds more pleasant shouldn't have anything to do with it, because it's not about what we want to be true, it's about what is most likely true. So how about it, Christians? Would you like to leave the message of God's love for you to join with us in a message of no purpose, no reason to live, and once you're dead, you cease to exist. Yeah. Who is he? He's an asshole, sir. Asshole. Major asshole. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> you, you're, it, it, you atheists are offering me somewhat like someone who has a luxury car and says, I'll trade you my skateboard for your luxury car. No, thank you. Keep your skateboard. <laughs> I'll keep driving my luxury car. More like telling the battered wife of a mob boss that she doesn't have to live this way. And through her black eye and busted teeth, she keeps proclaiming that he really loves me and everything he does to me is for my own good because I'm so bad that I really deserve it. I've got all of it coming. You atheists have no positive message. So I say to the atheists, come on, why not leave it? Why not believe in a God who made you? Why not believe that you were made with a reason, a purpose? Why not accept Jesus Christ? Have your sins forgiven? Know that you will have eternal life. For one simple reason, Tom. Because we do not choose our beliefs. We do not choose what we are convinced of or not convinced of. Tom, can you right now just up and choose to believe that you have a million dollar bill in your back pocket? Can you just choose to believe that and not just claim it? Not just tell others that you believe it while in your own mind you know that it's BS but truly and completely convince yourself that it's really there, even though all the evidence points against it. I mean, you put your own possessions in your own pockets, and your pockets have never been out of your control since you put your pants on this morning, and there was no million-dollar bill in them then, and you've had your hands in your pockets just five minutes ago, and there was no money in them then. And also, the little sticking point of the fact that there's never been a million-dollar bill printed by the U.S. Treasury in the first place. But can you make yourself ignore all of that and truly believe that that bill is in your back pocket? I'd lay odds that you can't. Because we don't choose what convinces us. We don't choose to believe things. We're either convinced of something or we're not convinced of something. So I couldn't choose to believe in God. All I could do is lie to myself and others and claim that I believe when deep down I don't. I should know that's what I did for a few years when my belief in God faded. But I didn't want to lose it so I lied to myself and told myself that I still believed as I attempted to search for reasons to continue being a Christian. But eventually I had to be honest with myself and admit that my belief in God was well and truly gone. And also, the real nitty-gritty that your entire video just blows right by and ignores entirely, it's not about what we want to be true. It's about what is actually true. It doesn't matter if you want there to be an afterlife of pleasure and eternal bliss. It doesn't matter if you want a cosmic big brother looking out for people. It doesn't matter if you want a divinely inspired purpose in your life and in the world and humanity at large. What you want is meaningless when it comes to what actually is. So if you want to be honest and face the reality of the world that we live in and the lives that we are faced with, you have to set aside what you want to be true and actually attempt to ascertain what is true. And that can be a hard thing to separate. 
We get so wrapped up in our desires for certain things that it becomes much, much easier to dwell in a fantasy than face what is perceived to be a colder truth. So when asking the big questions of life and existence, like where did it all come from? Why is the universe the way that it is? Is there any deeper meaning to it all? What you don't do is start off by saying, here's what I want it to be. Now let's try to find things that will confirm my biases and ignore things that contradict it. It's not about what any particular perspective has to offer. It's about what accurately comports with reality. It's about what you have good reason to accept as true. And not only is there no good reason to believe in God, but you didn't even attempt to offer any in this video. You just told us, wouldn't it be nice if there were? Now, believe in that nice thing just because. That's not how it works, Tom. That isn't how you reach truth. That's how you languish in self-deception. And so that is where we'll leave things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.